This is the Ancient and Medieval Lecture for Thursday, the 10th of June, 2021. The final lecture of this school year. Oh, so much sadness in our parting of ways. I, I feel, I will feel some. And so much joy for some of you until next year. <laughs> when most of you come back and join me again. Uh, it's good for you. It'll, it'll help scrub your mind like mental fluff. So, we were talking about the Mongols, who are the conquerors of the biggest land empire in human history. Well, let's see. Where's my Mongol map? Oh, it is... Wow. I actually only have one side of my Mongol map out, and it's the Yurts. Okay, let's see. It's bigger than the map there. Ah, I can do it on the world map behind Miss Peppa. What color should I use? Black? Yeah. Eh. And I'll bring red just in case. Orange. Yeah, orange. Okay. So, looking at the borders of the Mongol Empire. Uh, we'll start over here. Uh, basically, it includes... Korea, China, I don't think they go deep into Vietnam. Ultimately, it will include northern India, Iran, parts of Iraq, uh, Russia, and even into Poland and Hungary. Up uh, here, and basically indeterminate border up here far north. That's a big area of Eurasia. That's a huge area. Again, the biggest land empire in human history is the Mongol Empire. Uh, now, what that means is that in the time of Genghis Khan's successors, remember what Genghis Khan means, the Grand Emperor of Mankind, the Mongols conquer westward. They conquer northern India, where they become known as the Mughals. And they conquer Persia, and they conquer Mesopotamia, they conquer the Transcaucasian and Caucasus regions, they conquer Russia, Ukraine, they, again, drive uh, and threaten into Poland. They get as deep as Hungary before they leave. Um, and they get as far as the Baltic Sea. That's a big empire. Now, it doesn't stay unified. The descendants of Genghis Khan split it. So, for example, most of Russia is controlled by the Khanate of the Golden Horde. Whereas uh, there is Kublai Khan's greater China, East Asia, Korea area. Oh. Oh, excuse me. Um, in the area that we now know as northeastern Iran, a guy is born to the Mongols who becomes Muslim. Mongols are pagan for the most part. Now, his name is Timur. And Timur has a problem. Unlike most Muslim Mongols, he's alive but crippled. He's lame. One of his legs doesn't work properly. So he becomes known to his people and to history as Timur the Lame, which in English is translated as Tamerlane. Now, Timur the Lame launches attacks into, I guess I'll use the orange for him, Timur the Lame's empire. <clears throat> I guess I'll aim this over. Whoop. Okay. So, here we've got the greater Mongol lands that after Genghis Khan spread westward and divide. Tam Timur the Lame, or Tamerlane, ends up ruling and taking over an area of Central Asia 
which is known as the ill connect i l l k h a n a t e i'm sure i'm getting some of this map wrong uh, but basically, it's this area of Western Asia that becomes known as the Il Khanate. Now, sometimes when you combine things together, they don't make any sense. They're sort of yucky and silly and sick. The um, combination of Islam and Mongols makes Timberland one of the most dangerous leaders in human history. Because his army has Mongol fierceness, but at the same time, hello, because his army has Mongol fierceness, but at the same time has the Islamic belief in jihad, in dying right now for the faith, and so his armies are very effective. So Tamerlane, if you ever want to learn about a conqueror, uh, Timur or Tamar the Lane is, 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 worth, is worth studying. He may control more of India than I put on that map. Okay, I told you about Kublai Khan. I told you about the Kamikaze in Japan. Marco! Hello. Thank you. Would have been silly if nobody had answered. Uh, it's a fun pool game. Uh, I enjoyed playing it, and I still enjoy playing it because I'm weird. But... In Marco Polo, you have to close your eyes and tag somebody else. And the way you locate them is by shouting Marco and they say Polo. Now, this is, of course, based on the life experiences of the real Marco Polo, who was an Italian of the family Polo from Venice. The Polos were not shirts. They were, God, I think I'm funny. They were, um, I know I'm not, but I think I am, which is the tension that creates interesting stuff. The Polos were merchants, but they also wanted to explore. So, I think it's Nicolo Polo, Marco's father, if it's wrong, but I think it's Nicolo Polo, who gets up and leaves Venice to go east. And he gets onto the Silk Road, and he and his family travel east. And under the protection of the great Khan, he gets all the way to China. And the Polos are, are trading and traveling and talking and learning about people. And young Marco is writing down information about all of this. This journey takes decades. <laughs> While in China, Marco Polo becomes a friend of the emperor Kublai Khan. He actually spends time in Xanadu, the pleasure palace camp of Kublai Khan. He learns that Kublai Khan is an epileptic, subject to seizures. So uh, one of the things that the Polos do is they, they, they help with that, because the Polos have a different idea about health and medicine than does any Chinese doctor. Marco Polo and his family are there during one of the attacks on Japan. But that, he's not part of the attack, he's in the royal court when this happens. After a couple of decades of traveling, they decide to return. Now, most of the family has died. Not necessarily violently, although a couple. Mostly because time has gone on. People get old. They don't have modern medicine. They die. So Marco Polo comes back with a very reduced contingent of his family to Venice, the Doge of Venice, who's sort of the merchant prince of Venice, welcomes him. There's a big celebration. And then Marco organizes his notes and writes a book. Marco Polo's book is going to light the imaginations of Europeans about this mythical land of cafe, not cafe. Did I say cafe? Cafe. <sighs> about this mythical land of cafe. Cathay, C-A-T-H-A-Y. And this mythical land of Cathay, eh, with, its, with its Kublai Khan leader, becomes sort of uh, an inspiration for the more adventuresome Europeans who begin to talk about doing exploration themselves. Marco Polo is a role model. Now, there is another great medieval traveler who I should mention. And I'm going to add to the notes on this point. 
he has nothing to do with Marco Polo exactly, except he's sort of comparable to him. His name, you'll get a sense of who he is by his name, is Ibn Battuta. Ibn means son of. So Ibn Battuta, as he is known to history, is an Islamic traveler. Unlike Marco Polo, his travels don't take him to China. But Ibn Battuta does travel from Morocco across Islamic North Africa to Egypt, to the Middle East, to the Mughal areas on the edge of India, and back again. And he writes a book of his travels. The travels of Ibn Battuta are something that interest the, the people of the Middle East and excite them, but not quite in the same way that Marco Polo makes a bunch of European boys want to grow up to become explorers as men. Ibn Battuta's fail, tales are a little... They have a, they, have a, they have a different impact. They're sort of more... Oh, and that's interesting. I read that in Ibn Battuta. The deepest that the that the that the the deepest that the Mongols get into Europe is into central Hungary, which is almost at the geographical heart of Europe. At the Battle of the Sejo River, Mongols with rockets and primitive firearm cannons face the armies of the Holy Roman Empire and defeat them. I'll say again, they defeat them. So if the Mongols defeated the Central European armies at the Sejo River, why didn't they take over more of Europe? Well, do any of you know the story from the book? Because it was talked about. I want to remember why they didn't stay in Europe? That's okay. I'll tell you. They didn't stay in Europe because they got word just after the battle that the Great Khan had died. And if they wanted to influence who would become the next Great Khan, they would have to leave and go back and take part in the Great Conference of Mongols and tribes and leaders to determine who would be the next Great Khan. So from the heart of Europe, the Mongol armies ride east back to confer with the rest of the Mongol nation about who should be the new overlord, supreme overlord, grand magister overlord of the Mongols, and uh, they never come back. They find other things to do. The Golden Horde settles down in Russia. Now, if you ever wonder why Russia is different from the rest of Europe, and it is, you're going to learn about that next year, Russia is fundamentally different from the rest of Europe. It's because Russia has one foot in Europe and one foot in Asia. The Mongols ruled the Russians for over 200 years, in some cases longer than that. That means that for over 200 years, the Russians are under a non-Christian regime. The West and the East are different when it comes to casual brutality. In the East, there is not the same restraint against just lashing out at some. It is the rule of power. And the Mongols definitely practice the rule of unadulterated, unfettered, unlimited power. And the Russians pick this up as strength. To this day, the Russian nation and the Russian people have a tendency to glorify cruel and brutal leaders because of this Mongol influence on their society. Mongols are big and strong. They rule with iron fist. No one messes with Mongols. Yoshif Stalin is big and strong. He rules with iron fist. No one messes with Joe Stalin. Now, Stalin may have killed millions and millions, tens of millions, 30 to 60 millions of us. But no outsider will mess with us while Joe Stalin is in charge of Mother Russia, of Rodina. The Russians still respect naked power, raw strength, and brutal leaders. It's weird, but it comes from the time of Mongol influence. This is not a racial thing, it is a cultural thing. The Mongol culture was known particularly for its belief that brutality clarifies everything, that violence is almost always the answer. I'll say that again, that violence is almost always 
the answer. Any questions on the Mongols before we move on? Okay. Now, we approach the end. These are things I will probably bring up at the beginning of next year's course in summary terms. The first is the Hundred Years' War. Now, the Hundred Years' War is about who will control France. Remember, the King of France is not the most powerful nobleman in the country. At any given moment, the Duke of Normandy, who is also the King of England, may rule more of France than the King of France does. At any given moment, the Duke of Burgundy, who rules a lot of the territory between what is now France and Germany, might control more of France than the King of France. The King of France is relatively weak compared to these two men. Luckily for the King of France, the Duke of Burgundy's uh, apex of power is hundreds of years after the Duke of Normandy slash King of England. Who will rule France? England versus Germany. Fight! And the war is actually well over a hundred years. But there are pieces of pieces. There are small, short peace treaties that separate different parts of the Hundred Years' War. Now, during the Hundred Years' War, a few things become clear. First off, up until this point, the most powerful force on any European battlefield is the Armored Knight. And European armor was getting so much better. It was like a shrimp or a lobster armor by the 13 and uh, 1400s. This armor was articulated in such a way or articulated in such a way that you could have almost free movement. You're wearing 20, 30 pounds of metal, but it's in solid plates to block all sorts of attack. And if you're on a horse, the horse is also armored. So you've got a big Clivesdale's type horse armored with an armored knight on top that has weapons he can use from horseback. Lances, maces, morning stars, uh, swords. And the shock effect of a battle, they're called battles, a formation of armored cavalry, hitting any group of soldiers is enough to shatter them. But... In the Hundred Years' War, the English field a new type of soldier, the Welsh longbow. Now, when, Tol when Tolkien was coming up with his Lord of the Rings, he used the Welsh people as the basis for the elves, or rural bowmen. In Wales, they built a new type of bow, longer than any other, except for the Japanese Yumi bow. <clears throat> and there was no contact, so they did, they did it on their own. The Welsh longbow was so heavy and harsh, it took a lifetime to master. We have skeletons, exhumed skeletons of Welsh longbowmen who have fused bones in their wrists and arms because of daily training from age seven with longbows that ultimately changed how their arms function so that they can hold fire. So you pull back and you're holding onto the arrow and the amount of force on that arrow, on this string, <clears throat> is greater than any other type of bow. You've got to learn how to target offset. If I want to hit the earth behind my desk, I can aim straight because it's short. But if that earth is 100 yards away or more, I have to aim upward. If there's a wind, I have to compensate for the wind. <clears throat> to hit a target with a longbow, because it's so hard to use, Again, it takes daily training for a lifetime. But a longbow arrow can penetrate armor at range. The heaviest armed, armored European knights are not safe. <clears throat> so at the Battle of Cressy, which is not a name I expect you to remember this year, at the Battle of Cressy, the English fielded Welsh longbowmen that destroyed wave after wave of French knights. The Welsh longbows are going to continue to dominate the battlefield for a while, giving the English an advantage. In the early 1400s, a dynamic young English king named Henry V marches into France. At the Battle of Agincourt, with his uh, longbowmen and his knights, he defeats a French army that outnumbers him three to one. Henry becomes the dominant figure in France. 
Henry marries the Princess Royale of France. And the plan is for Henry and the Princess Royale to, to rule in peace a unified Anglo-French nation. France will no longer be a separate country. England and France will become a single nation under Henry V and his wife. The King of France will abdicate. Then Henry dies very, very young, just as this is being established. With Henry's death, that all falls to pieces. And the war resumes. But now it's late in the war. A peasant girl, 14 years old, named Joan, comes forward saying that the Virgin Mary has spoken to her. And the Virgin Mary has told her that France needs to rise up and fight. And that God wants France to win this particular war. She is compelling. She's not looked at like a lunatic. She becomes a Roman Catholic saint. A suit of armor is special made for Joan of Arc. And she leads an army as the symbolic head that relieves the siege of Orléans, a French city in the west that is surrounded by British troops. Her forces, motivated by the belief that St. Joan is leading them and that God is on their side and that the Virgin Mary has blessed them, win. And the French start winning and winning and winning. Because of Joan's morale boost, the French will ultimately win the Hundred Years' War and France and England will remain separate countries. St. Joan of Arc is also partially a saint in the Roman Catholic Church because of how she ends. She is captured alive by the English. They put her on trial as a witch. They think that her voices, they assert that her voices don't come from Mary or God. They come from the devil, from demons, from infernal and abyssal sources. She refuses to recant her faith. She refuses to denounce what she believes was genuine visions from God and the Virgin Mary. Yes. How old is she at this point? I think she's 16 or 17. She's still a teenager. She's Excellent. Thank you. So she is burned alive at the stake as a witch. She never renounces her faith. So there's a church in the local area that does Latin Rite Mass. It's named for St. Joan of Arc. Um, anyway, France wins the Hundred Years' War. You should know that. But it's a huge deal. In the mid-1300s, Europe is hit by a disease that comes out of the east. It comes from the Ottoman Empire to the cities of North Italy, which trade <clears throat> across the Mediterranean. It's called the Bubonic Plague, or the Black Death. There are many parts of the Black Death. Bubonic Plague is the most prominent part. People get buboes. Not buboes, buboes, which are swellings on their flesh. These buboes are filled with disgusting smelling pus. They blacken and bruise. The people who have this disease rave in fever dreams. And it's almost 100% fatal. The true definition of a pandemic plague is something that is both highly communicable and highly lethal. Those are the two qualities of any disease. Now, coronavirus, so COVID-19, is not really that. We didn't know that at the beginning, but we know now, at least at the moment, coronavirus is lethal, but not lethal enough to be really described as, a, as an epidemic or a pandemic. It tends to kill people who have compromised immune systems or are already old and weak. It doesn't really affect many people your age that much. But coronavirus, COVID-19, is highly communicable. It's easy to catch. The common cold is highly communicable, easy to catch. It's not very lethal unless you don't have modern medicine or unless you're old or, or sick already. AIDS, on the other hand, before modern treatments, was almost universally a death sentence, HIV, AIDS. But it's not very communicable. You get it through sexual congress because it's tra it, it travels in body fluids, warm body fluids. Now, were there cases where a person coughs 
onto a table who has AIDS, and then somebody accidentally puts their hand in the drying spittle and contracts it because they have an open wound on their hand? Yeah, that happened, but it wasn't that common. The AIDS virus was fairly delicate, didn't last long outside of a warm human body. So AIDS is highly lethal, but not highly communicable. Common cold is highly communicable, not highly lethal. The Black Death was highly communicable and highly lethal. So in wave after wave, usually every 15 or 20 years, the Black Death kills between one third and two thirds of the European population. I will say that again. The Black Death depending upon the time and place, kills between one-third and two-thirds of the European population. That's greater than any war. That's mega-death on a scale. And it wasn't always even. Poland was surprisingly uh, blessed in that the countries around it suffered majorly from the Black Death, but Poland didn't get hit very hard. Entire counties were left with three or four people left alive. Most diseases, most every, every disease we know of, there are people who are immune for whatever reason. We have never encountered a disease in the natural environment that nobody has a resistance to. There are always some people who survive. That's one of the scary things about your warfare. You got some nut, nut scientists and evil governments trying to breed super germs, which won't let anyone live. In any event, you've got a county the size of Kootenai in medieval terms. And maybe at the end of the Black Death, 10 or 15 people in the entire county would be left behind. That's serious stuff. It's not everywhere, but it's serious stuff. You have people who are plague doctors who wear these weird bird-like beak masks because it's designed to keep the spittle away from their faces and filter the air. But it's the Middle Ages. They don't know what they're doing. You've got a guy every few days who comes through the neighborhood. Bring out your dead! Bring out your dead! And you do. Because there are dead everywhere. The dead are thrown in mass graves lie or some other kind of agent is put on them so that the bodies will dissolve fairly quickly or they're burned in massive pyres. Everyone knows every someone who died. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. That little childhood song comes from the Black Death. Ring around the rosy is the irritated beginning of the red bubo. Pocket full of posies. People would walk around with flowers because of the smell of the dead and the dying. Ashes, ashes, you burn the bodies. We all fall down. Everybody dies. Remember, traditional folk tales for children are not happy ending Disney stories. They are brutal and vicious. <clears throat> Why? Because folk tales are supposed to prepare you for a world that has evil and death. To get you ready to face it. The big bad wolf wins in the traditional tales of Red Riding Hood. He's not defeated until after a lot of blood has been shed. So, the Black Death comes to Europe. Europeans, of course, blame the Jews. They say the Jews poisoned the wells. So there are pogroms, uh, officially sanctioned anti-Jewish riots all over Europe where the Jews are blamed because this must be a moral failing or this must be an attack by evil. Having everyone die, so many people die, come on. This is, come on, man, this is not normal. Somebody did this, so let's go burn the Jewish neighborhood. Or they blamed witches, evil witches, you know, concubines of Satan. So... They went after women, particularly, but there were men, witches, called warlocks, that were also killed, burned at the stake for being uh, pagan or for having any wisdom, folk wisdom, herbalism, healing, that sort of thing. Biggest persecution of witches in the history of Europe up to the 1600s. 
but it's not just witches that are the enemy. What animal is associated with witches as the familiar creature? A little animal that can be inhabited by a demonic force that aids the witch. Black cat. Black cat. In fact, not just the black cat, but all cats throughout Europe become the target of ravening mobs. The Europeans wipe out as many felines as they can in a desperate urge to prevent the plague from killing them and their loved ones. A futile hope. Now, history is filled with ironies. I hate irony. Irony is when you do the exact opposite thing that you should do because you don't know any better. And in comedy, it looks kind of funny. As we understand the disease today, it is carried by a type of flea. The fleas are carried on rats. I've already told you how filthy European cities were. Rats are everywhere. Flea on rat. Flea infects people. People get the disease. All fall down. Europeans murder en masse the only creature in Europe that can keep the rat population down, which are cats. Go figure. You can't make this stuff up. So the plague, <laughs> it just goes on and on. And eventually it peters out. Plagues do that. They, they, they run out of steam and, and, and hopefully, you know, it's over. It takes a while because, again, the Black Death comes back in waves. When you lose that many people, it changes the culture. So you have tales of the Grim Reaper. Death personified in a cowl with a skeletal visage, skeletal hands carrying a great scythe to cut down the living, to bring them to the lands of the dead, heaven or hell. Death doesn't care. Death is impartial. Death takes no signs. Death feels no shame or no pity. Death has a job to do. Everybody dies. I'm coming for you. It's your time. <laughs> There's a lot of art and a lot of literature wrapped up in this. European churches begin, these cathedrals, begin including more and more gruesome art. Art showing the Grim Reaper. Art showing the seven deadly sins. Sloth, envy, gluttony, lust, greed. And there are a couple of others. Wrath. Pride. Pride. Thank you. Who said that? Who said, thank you. I should write those down. I might actually remember them. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that as I'm talking. So, pride, envy, lust, gluttony, wrath, uh, lust. I already said lust. Uh, what else? Greed and sloth. Greed and sloth. Thank you. I actually should remember that as a Christian as well as as a uh, history teacher. So you have these gruesome personifications of these uh, of these seven deadly sins. You also have more art about the dying in hell, suffering at the hands of the devil and the demons, and you have uh, an increase in the use of gargoyles. I don't know if you know what a gargoyle is. It's sort of like a miniature dragon-human fusion with a demonic face. And in cathedrals, like at Notre Dame in France, Notre Dame du Paris, the gargoyles serve the purpose of being sort of rain gutters. So near the edges of the eaves of the roof of the cathedral, you've got these metal gargoyles that collect the water, and then the water pours out of their mouth. And they're like, Everything becomes dark. Death becomes a theme. There are comedies about death, tragedies about death. People seem obsessed by death. Why? Because they're surrounded by it. However, the Black Death, when it passes, does a couple of good things. First off, first off, there are relatively few survivors. And there's all that property. So for a while, the survivors divvy up the spoils of the dead, and people have more disposable income. 
And this is going to be like pouring lighter fluid on a campfire, which you shouldn't do unless you're very, very careful. Suddenly, why? Because people who didn't have any money before to spend now have money to spend. And they'll buy things. And that means that'll employ more merchants to sell them things and more people to produce things and more people to travel long distance and acquire the things that they want to buy. The economic engine is primed by the Black Death. People who survive have more money. They divide up the property of the dead. The second thing is that labor becomes more precious. Before the Black Death, there was an overpopulation in Europe. And what that means is there were more people than there were jobs. So your labor as a worker is much less valuable. But now it's hard to find anyone to do any job. So the people at the top of the society have to treat the people at the bottom of the society better or they'll leave. Oh, you don't want to treat me well? You want to overtax me? You want to beat me when you don't like what I'm doing? I'm just going to leave. I'll go to another farm where I'm appreciated. I'll go to another craftsman where I'm appreciated. The price of labor goes up, which also helps spark the economy. So the Black Death is going to be behind an economic uh, engine that becomes powerful enough to supply the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery with the money it needs. Also, the Black Death is what brings about a new piety. The hyper-political church is challenged by people like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Dominic and his order of preachers, uh, and others who try to bring the church and the faith back from a merely political organization trying <clears throat> to challenge the kings to a religious organization dedicated to caring for <clears throat> the spiritual needs of everyday Christians. A church that really does charity well. A church that helps feed the poor, and helps clothe the naked, and helps heal the sick, and helps shelter the homeless. The Franciscan friars become a very popular order that people join to live lives of service. The Dominicans, similar. But the service has to do with knowledge. More monks, more nuns, and more devout Christians who see the faith not as a political thing, but as a personal thing. All of this is leading towards, at the end of the Middle Ages, some big changes. First of all, Renaissance. The cities of North Italy that have been trading with the Arabs more and more because of the increase in money after the Black Death, begin making relationships with the Arabs in Syria and Egypt. They begin exchanging ideas. And soon, the cities of North Italy are wealthier than everyone else because they are the linchpin between Eastern luxury goods and Western customers. But they also become the most advanced places in Europe. Arab medicine is percolating and People learn that there are other ways to treat illnesses than bleeding. And this increase in cultural sophistication is going to not only bring enough money to do some interesting stuff, but it's also going to bring a return of the Greek and Roman knowledge. The Arabs never lost it. The Arabs took the Greek and Roman knowledge from the lands they conquered from the Byzantines, and they built on it. And the Arab knowledge and the Greek and Roman knowledge is coming back into Christian Europe. The word Renaissance means rebirth. The rebirth of the classical knowledge in a new Christian culture. The rebirth of the classical knowledge in a new Christian culture. The rebirth of the classical knowledge in a new Christian culture. So you've got the ideas of Cicero and the ideas of Plutarch and, and Marcus Aurelius and Eratosthenes and all of these ancient peoples coming back into Europe. But it's not the Roman world anymore. It's the Christian world. It's Christendom. And the Renaissance is the beginning, really, of our modern society. Also, in the Middle East, all the Muslims jack up the prices on Christians. Because, why not? Christians have to go to the Arabs to get stuff like silks and spices. Christians sometimes play dub pay double what everyone else pays. This is obnoxious. 
Eventually, increasingly intellectually curious and wealthy people start trying to figure out a way around this Islamic bottleneck in trade. And eventually what they will do is they will go out into the Atlantic along the coast of Africa to see if there's a way around Africa to the Indies. And even, according to that weird, crazy Italian guy, across the Atlantic to go from Europe to Asia because the world is round. And the end of the Middle Ages is two events. The first event is the fall of Constantinople in 1453. 1453 is when the last city of the Roman world See how well I wrote that? Um, finally falls. The Turks have heavy cannon. They blast through Constantine's walls. Constantinople becomes Istanbul. The other year the Middle Ages ends, that's the end of the classical world, is 1492. Not only did the Spanish complete their Reconquista in 1492, not only do they kick out the Jews to celebration in 1492, but they also send wacky Chris Columbus across the ocean blue. And he discovers what he thinks is a route to the East Indies. What we now know as his discovery of the West Indies and of the new world of North and South, what will later be called America. And that's it. That's the story of ancient medieval history told quickly and slowly through this year. Next week, you are on Tuesday. We'll take your exam. I'm just going to combine your medieval exam into the other one. So it's just one exam. And I may let you do corrections on all of it uh, if there's time. So use your study guides. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? And I'll see you Tuesday, and we'll say our farewells for the summer, at least, at that time. Thank you.